dreams. What's that all about? If you're a human being, no matter who you are or what you do, no matter how long you stay awake for, whether that's the typical 16 hours or several days at a time, at some point or another, you must fall asleep. And whether it's in a fantasy landscape or grounded in a slightly altered version of reality, whether it's taking place today, tomorrow, some distant time in the future, or a reliving of a memory from the past, whether it involves people from your life or creatures you've never met before, you will dream. And often, we don't experience these settings and environments exclusively per dream. Dreams seem to be more often made up of a combination of different times, places, and people, an amalgamation of our own personal experiences and our own psyche. For instance, in a dream, you may experience being around a friend or a relative, and then have them phase into a different person, perhaps even a fictional character, as events progress completely oblivious to this happening at all. Only to realize just how bizarre it actually is for that to happen when recalling the dream upon waking up. Dreams and the act of experiencing them is curious. It's thought to be our brain's way of relaxing and recharging, and whether you remember it when you wake up or completely forget it, we all dream. When thinking of the word dreamlike, a few things come to mind. Unreal, imaginary, ethereal. The appearance of spaces that would be too fantastic, surreal, and impossible to manifest in our own current understanding of reality. A passage of time, people, and surroundings that feels more like a moving sequence of entries, pockets, or events in a book, rather than one that transitions forward in a way that makes physical or even logical sense. What's going on with us when we're dreaming? What are our dreams about? Why do we have them, and what can we learn from them? Like the great unknown, these are some of the most burning curiosities that have plagued our species since cognizance really became a thing. And for good reason. We can't seem to agree on this one. The quick and dirty of it is, it's... complicated. So, where do we begin? the junction that lies between psychology and philosophy, between falsifiability and conjecture, between psychopathology and therapy, exists the mysterious yet wonderful world of dreaming. It's been theorized that dreams and by extension nightmares are a function to help prepare our minds for situations we might potentially experience in the future. For example, tonight you may dream about a squash, and let's just say that you do. Was it perhaps because you've been having anxiety about fruits and vegetables lately? Does that even make sense? Or was it just a meaningless coincidence? What about if you have a nightmare of being chased by an evil clown? Are you now better equipped should you encounter an actual evil clown in real life? And what about if on the same day as having this hypothetical dream, you were to be told that a clown showed up at the party you were planning to go to? Do our minds simulate events that might be relevant to us in our waking lives? So that when we're faced with a similar situation, perhaps in a moment of fight or flight, we might be better mentally equipped to handle the situation from our simulated experience. In some ways, this might harken back to the idea of seers, premonitions, omens, and the like. Dreaming of things to come, it's an intriguing concept and a trope that prevails quite a bit in fictional media. There's an idea that, as simulations of sorts, video games can have an effect on how we interact with dream space. More specifically, that large amounts of time spent in virtual reality gives us practice in moving around in abstract environments. It's believed that people who spend large amounts of time playing video games are more likely to have a better sense of directional control in a dream. In a nightmare setting, this also results in a higher likelihood to choose fight over flight, that is, if the perception that the dream is becoming a nightmare occurs at all. We might even be able to reverse engineer and relate this to another fascinating concept in dreaming. A valuable and perhaps legendary technique, the study of which is found at the juncture between science and the spiritual. Essentially this crossroads between that which others can observe and that which only you can. But before we can dive into the treat that is lucid dreaming, we must first dive into this metaphorical crossroads. So back to this idea of dreams being potential simulations for the future, or scars from the past. How much of that is valid? What if our dreams are meaningless? 
What if they're just matters of coincidence? Certainly, not everything we dream about is going to necessarily pan out in the waking world. At least, with the way some dreams can go off the rails, we should certainly hope not. And if they're not meaningless, how can we quantify them in a way that others can observe? This seems to be one of the great knowledge barriers in the phenomenon of dreaming, and it's led to two distinct avenues for studying this phenomenon. Did you know that there's a field of science that focuses on examining dreams? That's impossible! Well, not so much the study of dreams themselves, but rather more specifically, the process of dreaming. It's called onorology, and it aims to study the quantitative aspects of the dreaming process rather than the qualitative side pertaining to what dreams mean. In other words, there's a distinction between onorology and dream interpretation. More specifically, onorology examines any correlations that might exist between the process of dreaming and our current understanding of the functions of the brain. It essentially looks for an understanding of how the brain works during a dream session and how it might relate to the formation of memories and mental disorders. The field seemed to historically begin documentation in the 19th century with two French sinologists, Marquis de Ave du Saint-Denis and Alfred Maury. Though one might argue that onorology only really gained momentum in 1952, when a physiologist and sleep researcher by the name of Nathaniel Kleitman and his students Eugene Azarinsky and William Dement discovered regular sleep cycles. You might recognize this as REM and non-REM. You know, that creepy, twitchy thing that we do when we're unconscious. I imagine you've probably heard this before, so I'll try to give the TLDR. Essentially, there are three behavioral states of consciousness, excluding being comatose, of course. The state of consciousness that comes with heightened perception, realistic thinking, environmental responsiveness, and physical activity. The state I will presume or at least hope you're in now as you watch this video. So basically, when you're away, A state of what you might call light sleep that comes in three stages varying on the sleep depth or level of sleep. It's indicated by physical inactivity and decreased perception and responsiveness to the surrounding environment. We spend most of our time sleeping in non-REM, essentially the descent towards the deepest cycle during which apparent time the brain makes the body physically repair itself. It's thought that if you're feeling weak or fatigued, you could use more non-REM. And while it's rare, we can dream here. It's almost more commonly in the deeper stages of non-REM where we might find someone overlapping in a bizarre middle state like sleepwalking. The deepest cycle of sleep where you'd typically be experiencing a fully immersed dream world. On the outside, you'd exhibit no awareness of the real environment, in effectively what could be considered a paralyzed state, all while your eyes do this. It's at REM where it's thought that the psychological mending of the brain takes place, when the brain deletes any unnecessary memories or bits of information and reduces stress levels. It's thought that if you're feeling mentally ill, getting more REM will help. It's also thought that when a person experiences the terrifying event of sleep paralysis, it's because they've woken up while still in the REM stage. Though sleep paralysis is a whole topic for a later video. All the same, after REM we jump back to non-REM and start the cycle all over again. And we experience roughly 5 cycles over a typical sleep session. I thought he said he'd summarize it. I think that was the summary. But we already knew that sleep was vitally important for recharging our batteries. So, what else does onorology tell us? Well, for starters, sleep cycles are the reason you might recall more than one dream after waking up. Onorology explores the mechanisms and influences of dreaming, as well as the disorders linked to dreaming. So, it also overlaps with neurology, the branch of medicine and biology related to studying the nervous system, its anatomy, and its various functions and disorders. That is to say, unlike dreams themselves, the state of dreaming is observable. Onorology observes eye movements via electrooculography, or EOG, as well as muscle activity via electromyography, or EMG. In onorology, we're also able to analyze brain waves during a dream session via an electroencephalogram, or EEG, as it might be more commonly known. In a similar fashion to how polygraph tests can measure blood pressure, pulse, respiration, and even skin conductivity. Through conducting EEGs while a subject is dreaming, we're able to observe and measure the effects of drugs and neurotransmitters on the processes of sleeping and dreaming. 
With less focus on the origin of dreams, onorology, this study of dreaming as a function of brain activity, finds its usefulness and efficacy in the potential implications that it can produce for treating mental illness. Something I'm convinced is in many ways a resultant part of the human condition. We've also discovered that during REM, heavy activity has been observed in the limbic system and the amygdala. And as a result, it's thought that the essential repairing of our emotional and memory functions takes place while we're in a deep dream state. So at the very least, studying the process of dreaming might be able to help us understand how to treat things like depression and anxiety. I suppose the biggest curiosity of all this might be, is dreaming a byproduct of this nightly healing or a function? Let's say that dreaming is neither a byproduct or a function, but something else entirely. If you're human, I imagine the true reason that you're here is to find the answer to this question. What does it all mean? Sure, we know that sleeping is pretty vital to our survival, but why do we dream? The field of dream interpretation takes on this possibly age-old curiosity. However, variably, human beings are spiritual creatures. We seek to derive meaning in that which we do not understand things that are intangible and that often take the form of thoughts and ideas. I dreamed I was a butterfly, flitting around in the sky. Then I awoke. Now I wonder, am I a man who dreamt of being a butterfly, or am I a butterfly dreaming that I am a man? Indeed, mankind has been trying to interpret what dreams mean for a long time. And we've since begun to accumulate a long list of old myths, legends, and stories that seem to circulate around this curiosity. In Western and Northern European folklore, a mythical creature known as the Sandman sprinkles sand into our eyes, causing us to have good dreams. In Japanese mythology, a Baku is a creature that can be called upon to devour nightmares. In Greek mythology, the Onoroi are gods and demigods that rule over the world of sleep and dreams. The god and messenger of dreams was called Morpheus, which interestingly is where the opiate drug morphine got its name. His brother, Phantasos, was the god of surreal dreams. His other brother, Phobidor, was the personification of nightmares. Their father, Hypnos, was the god of sleep, as well as the son of Erebos, the god of darkness, and Nyx, the goddess of night. The Mare is a nightmarish personification of sleep paralysis. In Lovecraftian lore, there's a theory that suggests all of existence is the byproduct of a dream being had by the slumbering idiot god, Azathoth, an extra-dimensional entity thought to exist in the physical plane in the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. And when he awakens, we all blink out of existence. These are just stories, of course. Ancient Sumerians and Egyptians believed dreams to be visions sent down from gods, messages about the future. Greek philosopher Aristotle said that human beings are capable of achieving the pure form of wisdom only during sleep, when our minds are liberated. Hippocrates, regarded as the father of modern medicine, believed dreams were powerful indicators of mental and physical health. And at the height of Greek power, the prophecies of oracles, ones which heavily influenced military decisions, were largely based on dreams. If you lived in Rome during the rule of Augustus, successor to Julius Caesar, you would have been required by law to discuss your dreams if they had anything to do with the empire. Full stop. This is where things get significantly more abstract. Some researchers believe that dreaming is a meaningless byproduct of the physiological processes that occur during REM and non-REM. Others believe that they are vital to the process of healing our emotional, physical, and mental health. They can be revelatory in reaching certain breakthroughs upon examining whatever they might mean, and at other times, completely random and nonsensical. All the same, researchers and dreamers the world over can't seem to agree. Indeed, trying to figure out the meaning behind dreams is no simple task, and one neurologist shared this ambition to make sense of this burning curiosity. Sigmund Freud found that many of his patients spoke about their dreams during their sessions, he began to theorize that dreams might have more significance to our psyche in our day-to-day -day lives, and eventually came up with the theory that we have an unconscious mind. Similar to Hippocrates before him, Freud theorized that dreams can reveal important things about the mental state and motivations of a person. But in order for it to make sense, the personality had to consist of more than one structure. 
This would lead to the formation of the id, ego, and superego, three components thought to make up a personality. Basically, the id is the part of the personality that is our primitive, instinctual wants and desires. The ones we're born with. Sex, aggression, which go on to say life and death, essentially. Id is the aspect of our personality that operates with the unconscious mind, throwing logic and learned information out the window, thoughtlessly seeking to fulfill impulses, seeking to achieve pleasure and avoid tension. With the id, there's no consideration for objective reality. This is the fantasy-oriented, selfish, and wishful component of our personality. So if we made the analogy that the id is nature, then perhaps the nurture side would be the ego and the superego. So what are those? The superego is essentially our theorized moral compass, our conscience. It conceptualizes our ideal self, how we think we should be. And it uses the learned morals and values from society and even upbringing, and contrasts them with the impulsive desires of the id. It creates a reward and punishment standard, making us feel guilt or pride whether we're able to keep the desires of the id in check. And so between the id and the superego, there's often a dissonance. I want X now, but I value Y. This is where the ego comes in. It's the part of the personality that mediates between the often irrational desires of the id and the moral ruminations of the superego, and decides on how to behave in a way that will satisfy desires while simultaneously making the most socially acceptable sense in reality. The id, ego, and superego work together to shape a person's personality and behavior. So that's great and all, but what does this all have to do with dreams? The theory is that when a person is sleeping, the superego becomes inactive, allowing the id, the expression of our wants and desires, to roam free, uninhibited. And if that is the case, then our dreams are indeed useful in helping us understand ourselves a little bit better, through our unconscious desires. However, I did mention that this is where things get a bit more abstract, and it's important to note that Freud's concept of id, ego, and superego isn't scientifically verifiable. They are simply metaphors of the mind, there isn't actually a way to empirically verify their existence, which is part of the reason why the subject has been up for debate among researchers for so long. But in order to achieve a better understanding, we should ask questions, and we have to start somewhere. But even if this were true, do dreams necessarily always paint a picture of our unconscious motivations? For example, in The Shining, Jack Torrance is a character who struggles to maintain his own sanity. He grows mentally unstable and eventually attempts to murder his own family with an axe. But before he gets to that point, he first starts to experience horrific nightmares. It's the most horrible dream I ever had. It's okay, it's okay now. Well, I dreamed that I, that I killed you and Danny. But I didn't just kill you. I cut you up in little pieces. We can see that he's troubled by these ideas, almost as if the id desires blood. The superego recognizes these thoughts as wrong, making him fearful and guilty, and the ego is struggling to make sense of it all. Does this theory suggest that somewhere in Jack's unconscious mind there exists a rationale for why his family being dead would benefit him in some way? Or is his growing animosity towards his family primarily influenced by the powerful supernatural elements at the Overlook Hotel? And if it's both, how much of the dreaming unconscious mind, these visions he experienced, have to do with his later behavior? Here's Johnny! Psychoanalyst Carl Jung also valued dreams. He saw the mind, body, and feelings as all working together in what he called the psyche. And he believed the psyche to be a self-regulating system. Negative symptoms were indicative of an imbalance in the psyche. For example, depression might stem from a suppression of feelings or behaving in a manner contradictory of one's own nature. Essentially, when we grow accustomed to repressing ourselves without any sort of release to balance things out, well, it's a slippery slope to becoming imbalanced. Conversely, too much indulgence and not enough moderation leads to a similar disrepair of the mind. 
For example, when I spend the whole weekend playing video games and not creating something, I begin to feel anxious and depressed. And the only thing that really gets me out of that rut is by finding a way to get creative again. So to Jung, dreams were our psyche's attempt to communicate important things to us. He saw the psyche as an integration of archetypes. Think mythology, all those gods and goddesses, the myths and origin stories of our past. Jung argued that these mythical figures are rooted in the human psyche. He disagreed with the idea of a monotheistic self, the idea that there is but one true self. He believed more so in the polytheistic self, the idea that the self is made up of various archetypes, parts that when integrated work together as a whole, but maintain their distinct forms, functions, and identities. An understanding of the self through a polytheistic approach, an idea that acknowledges that within all of us is the angel, the mother, the father, the crone, the shadow, the light, and so on. Psychological distress manifests when one of these archetypes is denied or concealed by the person. Jung proposed that these cast-aside archetypes appear to us in our dreams, indicating their need for attention and expression. Jung and Freud were, for a time, colleagues and friends, and are both widely considered to be major pioneering figures in the world of psychoanalysis. However, they disagreed on the reason why we dream, and the distinction is so subtle, it can be a bit confusing. And I think this confusion is largely due to how we have a tendency to frame differences in a zero-sum, us-versus-them mentality. We commonly share ideologies on the meaning of dreaming that are a mix of both Jungian and Freudian ideas. So here's the difference between the two. Freud believed that our dreams were a bridge to the unbound unconscious mind, which held ideas and beliefs that were of an inherently negative nature, ones we repressed when awake. It was his belief that the unconscious, this theorized id, was where we stored all of our repressed thoughts, traumatic memories, and even sexual and aggressive desires. And when we dream, that's when they're expressed. So if you dreamt of a large stick, Freud probably would have correlated it to you dreaming of a large <laughs> Jung agreed with Freud that the unconscious mind was accessed through dreams, though he expanded that their contents are open to subjective, personal interpretation. Jung also divided the personality into three parts, but instead of Freud's model, Jung believed that the psyche was made up of the ego, the personal unconscious, and the collective unconscious. Unlike Freud, Jung didn't think dreams were always necessarily of a hidden, disguised, or repressed sexual nature. Indeed, his concept for what made up the unconscious mind and how to interpret it was starkly different from Freud's. We are not of today or of yesterday. We are of an immense age. Jung was inspired by the philosophies and mythologies of the world. He believed we could derive meaning from symbolism and applied this to the study of dream interpretation. So here's an example I found. Let's say you dream of a tidal wave. Freudian dream analysis would involve us humans interpreting the symbol of a wave. We'd likely look at a wave as a symbol of rebirth and try to extrapolate meaning from that. Jung in dream analysis would instead let the symbols speak for themselves. We, as a society, might see a tidal wave in a dream as a collective symbol for rebirth, but if we take away ascribing the collective symbolism, what does the tidal wave tell you specifically? Sound confusing? Yeah, I still had difficulty making the distinction myself. But perhaps to understand it, I needed a more personal example. When I was about four years old, I used to have a recurring nightmare. In the dream, it was always the same. I was in hell and the devil was standing over me with a large cauldron. When I say large, I mean it was incomprehensibly colossal. It could have been the size of a mountain or the size of a planet for all I knew. The devil, he was laughing maniacally and was stirring something in this cosmic cauldron. It was of all things, uncooked grains of rice. They filled the cauldron to the brim. He wasn't cooking them, and he didn't want to cook or eat me. So why was he there, stirring this massive cauldron over me? Why was he laughing? Because every time I'd have that nightmare, he tasked me with counting every single piece of rice inside that cauldron. That was the nightmare. This horrible task that I would never complete. Every time I found myself in that dream, a dread washed over me. 
Not because I was in hell or because I was in the presence of the devil. It was because I couldn't fathom the mundane task of counting what could very well be an infinite quantity of rice for the rest of eternity. I'm not a very religious person, but I was raised in a religious household and so I was exposed to the mythology since before I can remember. And I imagine the Freudian approach to analyzing this example might be the interpretation that I was experiencing a simulation of hell. And what does hell collectively symbolize? Perhaps I was being shown this as a reminder of something to fear, something so horrible I'd be motivated to be good, to avoid the prototypical eternal damnation. Perhaps this dream was my psyche reminding me not to sin or indulge, and to repent. But again, that's just what I posture a Freudian interpretation might be of this silly nightmare. What I took away from this recurring dream, what I take away from it today as I recall it, is that for me, the thought of doing something so mind-numbingly mundane for an effectively infinite amount of the foreseeable future is a reminder that in my waking life, I abhor the feeling of stagnation, of doing things that I don't want to do. To me, remembering the recurring nightmare I used to have as a kid evokes a motivation to keep things always evolving and fresh, lest I start to feel the mind-numbing sensation of repetition. And this makes sense to me, but that's only because I know that I can be incredibly lazy and have a tendency to lack discipline. I never sleep at normal hours, I eat too much, and I eat too little. I dive into holes of video game addiction. This impossible task of counting rice forever, to me, it symbolizes maintaining balance. To not get too comfortable in my tendency to overindulge or be lazy, but to also never forgo what I want to do. So let's rewind for a second. How do we go from a devil's cauldron to a symbol for balance? Someone else might have the same dream and find a completely different meaning in this cosmic cauldron of rice. The point is, it's an interpretation that probably only makes sense to me. This is what the Jungian side of the dream interpretation postures, and this is the distinction between the Jungian and the Freudian approach. At least, that's the way I understand it. For in dreams, we enter a world that's entirely our own. Let them swim in the deepest ocean, or glide over the highest cloud. So we have onorology and we have dream interpretation, but how do these two connect and where? What else can we explore? In applying our observations of dreaming in a clinical setting to observations of mental disorders, we might want to look at the usefulness of dream logging. When you log a dream, the details are important, not just what happened, mood, feel, color, sounds, sensations, as much vivid detail as you can recall to preserve the clearest possible snapshot. Dr. Irvin Yalom, an existentialist, encourages describing the dream as it is happening, rather than as it happened. So, I dreamed that I was standing on the bow of a ship, it was raining and I was cold, becomes, I'm standing on the bow of a ship, it is raining and I am cold. Which one feels more vivid? Still, there doesn't seem to be a way to objectively capture cognitive thoughts, much less dreams. We couldn't, for example, burn your memories onto a film and throw it into a projector to view and show people. So the most vivid painting of the experience is required to evoke a sensation solid enough to extrapolate any meaning from. With onorology, we might be able to cross-section external data like the timing and spikes of brainwaves, for instance, during a particularly powerful, logged dreaming experience. But again, that would be based on an entirely subjective dreaming experience, one that nobody else could see. Or could we? In 2013, scientists at the ATR Computational Neuroscience Laboratories in Kyoto, Japan began creating a lexicon of dream language. This was done by observing and comparing MRIs of a dreamer's brain to the dreamer's description of the imagery they saw while they were dreaming. After gathering 200 of these reports, they were able to put together a lexical database of dreamed objects, albeit elementary, and organize them into categories such as street, furniture, and girl. 
They contrasted this information with data collected when presenting the same imagery to subjects while they were awake, and found via MRIs that a similar brain activity takes place here too. This suggests that our brain activity while dreaming is similar to when we're awake, and this may begin to explain why our dreams can seem so vivid. Kamitani, one of the researchers said, using a database of picture elicited brain activity and a pattern recognition algorithm, we can read out or decode what a person might be seeing from brain scans during dreaming. Could this research evolve in time to give us a clearer perspective of the deeper, more emotional aspects of dreaming? Could we, say, plug this algorithm into a supercomputer which could then translate the descriptions and neurological information into a sequence of generated imagery? But back to where onorology and dream interpretation meet. It's at this point in the video where I'd like to introduce what I've decided to call the contrasting curiosity canons because we're about to shoot a bunch of conflicting questions at what we've learned so far. First, how much can we trust the philosophical approach if we're trying to remain scientific? And even further, to what extent did Freud, Jung, and all the curious minds before us have these things right? Can we even view these findings as the end-all be-all on dream research? Their conclusions don't seem all that strong relative to other observable sciences, and couldn't it be argued that Freud was supremely subjective in his theories? And what about Jung? Wasn't he a controversial figure because his theories stemmed from a more abstract foray into the depths of various religions, mythology, and the philosophical? And what about the dreams where absolute nonsense occurs? How do we explain that? I remember one really dumb nightmare I had one time. I was being chased by Sephiroth from Final Fantasy <laughs> VII. Um, <laughs> And I ran into this big abandoned amusement park, and he was chasing me with his sexy hair and his, his, <laughs> his exposed chest and his big sword <laughs> and his fuck me eyes. Uh, and uh, I remember I, at one point I like jumped on him and I started bashing his face in with a rock, but it was almost like his face was made out of steel. Like it, my it fucking barely made a dent. Like I was trying to beat Goku over the head. Right. right. Um, but yeah. Tell me what that means, psychologists. Yeah. By the way, I started a podcast about Jinji Ito that you should absolutely check free on iTunes. But at the same time, how much can we assume that there is an absolute and indisputable truth? Are we limiting ourselves if we only seek answers in terms of positivist science? This assumption that anything that can't be measured has no value. More abstract things like dreams, psychology, and philosophy these social sciences, if we can't put a numerical lens to them, or define them in terms of falsifiable formulas and equations, does it necessarily mean that they, as sciences of their own, have no value? Is this even a fair comparison? And in terms of the social sciences, is objectivity but a myth? Should we or shouldn't we challenge this? If it's impossible to completely remove subjectivity from social scientific research, then does that take away its value, or does it have no value in hard science? That it's pseudoscientific? Is it correct to apply the classical rules of natural hard science to the world of social soft science? Is it correct to emulate the natural sciences in search of a social scientific method? What if we're trying to explain things with the wrong language? What if the soft sciences need a different set of rules for assumptions of scientific validity? If this sort of science is subjective, can we perhaps redefine the parameters of what makes it valuable? As for falsifiability and validity with regards to dreams, the takeaway from the most academic of findings is to take it with a grain of salt. And the reason behind that is- Wait, before we get to that, we have a few other avenues of dreaming to explore. Earlier, I mentioned a crossroads, a dimension between the psychological and philosophical. As much as I wish I was about to say, That's the signpost up ahead, your next stop, the twilight zone. I'm talking about the subject of lucid dreaming. Essentially, being aware that you're in a dream. The topic was relatively obscure, until we saw the idea popularized and wildly fantasized in the mainstream, via Inception. 
While not necessarily always the case, lucid dreamers have reported that they've experienced greater control in their dream sessions. Imagine being able to control the narrative of your dream, to bend and break reality as you saw fit, to set up simulations based around your own fears, or around your own fantasies. Then there's the false awakening, a dream within a dream. When you dream that you've woken up and it's so vivid that you're convinced it's reality, when really, you're still sleeping. It's been found that a false awakening is far more likely to occur in the same dream session where a lucid dream experience is taking place. There's also the conceptualized phenomenon of continuum, a concept heavily popularized by A Nightmare on Elm Street. When you're unaware you've fallen asleep in reality because your dream world has continued the environment of your waking state. So, lucidity refers to clarity. And it's been suggested that developing the ability to be aware that you're dreaming can help if you suffer from chronic nightmares. And perhaps practicing lucid dreaming might help us understand things about life and even characters that can be applied to real life with therapeutic benefits. The main takeaway in looking at lucid dreaming in this mystery and confusion of dream research is that lucid dreaming has valuable therapeutic aspects. But one thing is sure, a great change of our psychological attitude is imminent. That is certain. And why? Because we need more. We need more psychology. We need more understanding of human nature because the only real danger that exists is man himself. He is the great danger. And we are pitifully unaware of it. We know nothing of man. Far too little. Man cannot stand a meaningless life. So the research on dreams is quite extensive, and yet the answers we currently have aren't quite satisfying. And the mystery surrounding dreams isn't new or exclusive to us living today. Perhaps we might gain more insight from the past. So what if we explored the etymology of the word dream? After a quick search, I found that there seemed to be conflicting theories on the matter. If you go back far enough, the single point of origin for virtually all language understandably fades into obscurity. So there's been some disagreement regarding the etymology of the word dream. In the mid-13th century, it was described as a sequence of sensations passing through a sleeping person's mind. The word dream has possible links to various languages across the Indo-European landscape. The Old Saxon word drum means merriment or noise. Dream may have also stemmed from the Old High German word trom, and might come from the Proto-Germanic word drachmas, which means deception, illusion, and phantasm. The online etymology dictionary also points to a possible relation between dream and the Sanskrit word dra, which means to seek to harm or injure as well as the word drus from Avestan, an early Iranian language, which means to lie or deceive. If we look to the origin of Old English, the word dream was defined as simply joy, mirth, and noisy merriment, which means tearfulness, as well as the increasingly unrelated term, music. So what can we take away from all this? Well, for one, investigating etymology is complicated. But on the other hand, if these are more than potential connections, we're able to extract words like deception, illusion, and lie. We're also able to extract words like harm and injure, and even more seemingly unrelated words like joy, merriment, and even music. What does this mean? Are they connected? And if so, how are they connected? Could it be a reference to how music is an illusion that brings on a sensation analogous to joy and happiness, something which in and of itself could be seen as illusion in the human experience? Is that what dreams are? Illusions which, just like music, are simply meant to bring us a sense of joy or euphoria while we sleep. And where does the word harm come into play? After all, joy and happiness aren't the only emotions that can be evoked by music. And why should we assume that harm isn't related to joy? For example, isn't it harmful to shun the darker aspects to focus only on the positive? Admittedly, this is only the surface of what truly lies at the bottom of the etymology rabbit hole. These aren't the only cultures to speak of dreams. 
And if all sources of etymology throughout different cultures and times each have their own contribution to a collective unconscious for what dreams are, this is only the beginning. Or is it the case that there is no meaning at all to this etymology nonsense, coincidences and meanings are unrelated, and words just develop the way they do in different parts of the world? Could it be both? So back to the main question at hand, why do we dream? Before I said something along the lines of take it with a grain of salt, well we dove rather deep into the subject and so far, well, perhaps you've begun to suspect the same disappointing conclusion. Why do we dream? I don't know. But even more so than that, we might never know. Dreams are a subject that is still so open for interpretation. We've learned a couple of things, but like with much of the universe around us that we still don't understand, it seems that the more we know, the more we realize just how much we don't know. But perhaps part of the beauty in our inability to fully comprehend our dreams is that in pondering their meaning, exploring their infinite possibilities whether lucid or not, we can realize things about ourselves and the world around us that might serve to heal us and help us grow. Could we eventually see a technology that allows us to share cognitive dream space like in Inception? Could we ever fall into a nightmare loop of experiencing centuries of time within a single dream session like in Junji Ito's The Long Dream? In the depths of our collective ignorance, one might suppose that anything is possible. Perhaps to ask why we dream is to ask why we think, or why gravity behaves in the way that it does. Or... Philosophers and psychologists have been working on this idea for a long time. A joke among therapists is that sometimes the best and only answer that they can offer their clients is, I don't know. That is the plight of existentialism. A large factor in our collective human distress is the seemingly infinite and unanswered whys of the world. And the answer is probably meaningless. Much like existence, dreams are a deeply personal experience. What's important is this. What does it mean to you? Perhaps like an idea once put forth by a French philosopher, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings immersed in a human experience. After all that we've come to understand, I think the meaning of a dream is what you make of it. So now I ask you, why do you think we dream? What do dreams mean to you?